Hi, I'm Francis Hellier, and welcome to my podcast, Metaverse. This is a podcast for the future-minded, a series for anyone on the hunt for the next big thing and all its possibilities and implications. With each episode, I will chat to those at the top of their fields, from futurists in crypto and space travel to forecasters in business and tech. Together, we'll ask the question, what's next? Today, I'm joined by Apuva Shah, founder and chief executive of Duality Robotics, Founded in 2018, the company is devoted to pioneering the enterprise metaverse to solve real-world problems. Prior to this, Apuva was head of creative technology and design systems at Capital One and visual effects supervisor and member of the technical brain trust at Pixar. His film credits include Ratatouille, Shrek, Finding Nemo, and Toy Story 3. I'm sure you've never heard of those. He is also an adjunct professor at Emerging Technology at the California College of the Arts, covering topics such as metaverse design and designing for trust, and is an advisor for the nonprofits Kids and Art. Apuva, it's, uh, it's uh, fantastic to have you on the show and such an honor to have you with us today. Francis, thank you so much for the kind introduction. And, and uh, you know, it's just wonderful to be here with you today and, and you know, just talk about this wonderful topic. So let's let's start at the very beginning with Duality Robotics. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the founding journey and and your mission with this space? Yeah, no. Uh, so basically, the way, way we got started is is you know they say opposites attract, and so my co-founder Mike Taylor, uh, you know, makes his home very much in the physical world. He's a he's a robotics engineer, you know, a hardcore controls engineer spent a bunch of his career at Caterpillar, basically building large yellow machines the size of houses, that, you know, can, can basically destroy things in a very physical way within a few seconds. <laughs> um, and uh, for me, my home has always been in the virtual, as you mentioned, you know, some of the films that I've worked on. Uh, you know, most of my career was at Pixar, where I was also on the technical brain trust there. Um, and, you know, for a long time, we've created these, um, you know, fairly extensive worlds, you know, whether it's the Paris and Ratatouille or, you know, the sprawling world of cars or the underwater world of Finding Nemo. Similarly, on the visual effects side, you know, if you go and watch a Star Wars movie today or, you know, something from, you know, um, from the superhero universe, I mean, most of what you're seeing is actually virtual, right? And those worlds, certainly they have a different focus, you know, they are there to tell stories and, and convince us as audiences to immerse ourselves completely within, within uh, you know, within those environments and those characters. Um, so the conversation that started between Mike and me really was, you know, what, what if we could take the sort of passion and creativity that goes into building a world for Pixar and combining that with the precision and the rigor it takes to build a caterpillar machine. You know, if you could combine those two things, then potentially there's all kinds of very, very uh, difficult and high impact problems that, you know, um, suddenly become solvable. And, and that is, by the way, also how we, we really think about the enterprise metaverse, right? So in, in the, um, you know, in, in, in the sort of worlds we build on the visual effects on the feature animation side, you know, the worlds are being built for storytelling, but the worlds that we build at, you know, at duality are there to essentially allow, you know, uh, machines, enterprise systems to generate data, to understand, you know, their autonomy software, to learn about how they will behave in very different kinds of situations. And so that dynamism still uh, is very, very important. So you're building a metaverse for uh, solving real world problems. How are you how are you doing that? And how are you ensuring that the behaviors are sort of predictive of of the real world? Yeah, no, fantastic, fantastic question. And, and, and you know, that, that, that's where obviously the, the buck stops, as it were, right? <laughs> so I'll give you an example of, um, you know, maybe a couple of the ways that we work with customers, right? So just to ground the, the sort of uh, answer in some real, real examples. So there was some work we did, uh, you know, with Honeywell Aerospace, where they were building a drone system to basically... Um, inspect energy infrastructure. Now, energy infrastructure, you know, and here in California, that's a huge issue for us. Um, and, you know, energy infrastructure is, is, is often aging, it's sprawled over, you know, thousands of miles, makes it particularly difficult to do 
predictive maintenance, right? It's where, where you, you're looking for a needle in a haystack. And so, so the Honeywell team had this great idea to basically use a drone fleet to start identifying potential uh, points of failure within the infrastructure. Now to train that system, they need lots and lots of data, lots of data about both what a regular infrastructure looks like. And then also as you have anomalies in the infrastructure, whether it's you know, rotting beams or chipped insulators or encroaching vegetation, you know, machine learning systems learn from this kind of synthetic data, right? And, and so basically um, the challenge in deploying systems like that, you know, you can build prototypes very quickly, but when you actually have to deploy the systems, you have to be able to guarantee you know, to customers in this case, you know, utility companies that, hey, we will be able to find every kind of problem that is there, uh, you know, potentially in a certain domain. And you could, you know, you, the, the problem of building the system at that point is not even building the machine learning model as much as finding, curating, and, and you know, training your, your machine learning models with all these comprehensive data sets. And that often becomes a bottleneck is what we've found with our customers. So what we uh, did with them is essentially built out about a four square kilometer uh, place actually where you know, one of the customers was operating. So it's based, again, this is why it's not a game, it's real world data. It's based on GIS data, satellite imagery. And you know, we built them a biome that is you know, very accurate in terms of the conditions of that, of that particular environment. And then within that, once that environment has been built, just like we would build for Ratatouille or Finding Nemo, you know, once we build that environment, in this case, of course, built from real world data, right? Then we can intentionally start changing it. We can start introducing anomalies into it. We can start introducing edge cases. And I'm giving you an example of a static environment in this case, but the same applies even if there were bicyclists in the environment, you know, there were weather changes. So these environments are, are fully dynamic you know, just like our real world environments are and can be essentially um, tuned and, and, and set up in lots of different conditions, right? Now, once we've built this environment, then, you know, we have a suite of sensors. So similar to what you would find on a drone system or, or a robotic system, and they can start generating data, right? Now this data, of course, as you pointed out in your question, has only has value if it's predictive of the real world. So we've taken, and this is again where, you know, that a lot of what we're talking about is tied to the techniques we've used in, you know, entertainment before, but this is where it starts to diverge, right? So our simulator is based very much on real world physics. You know, we give timing guarantees to our customers, right? Like, so they, they can expect data that has very accurate timestamps, follows real physical laws. And, you know, we've shown with every customer, because obviously the customers come with the same skepticism, right? Like, hey, is this data actually gonna be meaningful for me? And so we've shown from everything from, you know, drone systems to, you know, large self-driving trucks that what our simulator produces, the data, you know, this enterprise metaverse produces is accurate, you know, within a few centimeters or for machine learning models is, you know, uh, 98, 99% predictive of what would happen with field data. Right. Now, so, yeah, sorry. sorry, sorry to interrupt. So you're, just to clarify this, your, uh, system is powered by your uh, digital twin simulator falcon that's correct um can you can you give a little bit of insight as to uh the technicals around that and how the falcon architecture works i think for our, for our listeners mm. we want to understand exactly how how this works uh, in your space and how this how this has real world meaning Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, let me start by saying that, you know, one of our strong partners is Epic Games, which makes the Unreal Engine. So we start from there. So we use the Unreal Engine as a 3D operating system. You know, we believe it has one of the best real-time renderers and, and, you know, a sort of scene management system, 3D scene management system. So we start with that foundational layer. And then what we put on top of it is sort of the entire machine models, you know, that you might have in robotic systems. We have a whole library of sensors that can be tweaked to match real world sensors. And then one of the key elements is unlike a game where you, know, you sort of have a fixed world, in our case, customers are very different. You know, one customer might be doing a retail environment. Another one might be doing a warehouse. One of them may be doing a flying drone. You know, the other one might be doing basically um, you know, a robotic, like a AMR, uh, you know, autonomous mobile robot within a warehouse. 
So we have to make sure that uh, we can bring in these different definitions, whether they are for environments or machines and, and what we call scenarios. Those are the initial conditions, right? That, that will launch, launch the, you know, whatever data collection you want to do. So we have settled on a format called universal scene description, which you know, is an open source format that comes out of Pixar. We are working with folks you know, across the industry spectrum, uh, you know, of course, including Pixar, where you know, I still have very good relationships to see if um, USD potentially should become a way to define uh, digital twins. You know, uh, and, and and HTML for the metaverse, if you will, right? Because we believe it's it's a very powerful way of representing three D information, but it also goes beyond that. You know, it can it can capture other physical attributes of of systems, and so uh, there's a lot of uh, folks, right, including us, who believe that uh, in order for customers to really get value out of this enterprise metaverse. It's very important for it to not be a walled garden, right? It needs to be something that is actually based on open standards, um, and and that is what you know we we are very actively working on, you know, through consortiums like Digital Twin Consortium. You know, thousand thousand percent agreed on that point. Um, I think you know again for us to to really to grasp this opportunity, all of us together, um, decentralization and the fact that it's an open. Uh, you know, open open field for everyone is really important. Now your team holds, I think it's over 50 patents across robotics <laughs> and simulation and visualization, which you know in, in itself is is nothing short of amazing. So can you can you tell us some of those patents that you have and and again, is it is that restrictive to this open metaverse that we talk about? Uh, so, so you know, I mean, the patents. So, I'll, I'll uh, explain the two things. So, first of all, the team has got such a diverse. I mean, we are blessed, Francis, in having an amazing team that would be the envy of any tech giant. And you know, largely the team has come around this work because we are all passionate about it, and and you know, we are all excited about it. Um, so, so a lot of these patents have come out of work we have done in the past. You know, whether it's for me, you know, rendering and simulation work that I have done, you know, at Pixar. You know, um, Mike has done, you know, obviously lots of control engineering work, including the first DARPA, uh, you know, grand challenge, which really kicked off the whole self-driving car revolution. So, you know, these are patterns that have come out of uh, routinely the work we do. You know, I have some patterns from Capital One as well around payment systems and so on. Um, the, our, our approach, you know, we've also obviously as a, as a company, we have filed some patents as well around, you know, this idea of the enterprise metaverse and, and autonomous systems. Uh, you know, simulation for autonomous systems, but we we see it largely uh, as a as a defensive uh, kind of strategy, right? We we don't, for us, the, the patents are there to protect us, not to prevent others, if you will, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and uh, you know, we talked about the open source sort of paradigm before, and or the open standard paradigm, right? Really to create interoperability, and I, I believe that for a standard to have value, you know, it must have a backbone in some of this kind of intellectual property and, 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 and an actual code that a developer can use, right? It's great to have an abstract uh, sort of standard or a concept to strive for, but if, you know, you, the building blocks don't exist, then I think there's, you know, you, you cannot build interoperable standards that way. Um, and so I think, you know, all of this sort of goes towards that, right? The, the generation of intellectual property the the building you know the creating of these sort of building blocks for for implementing a standard and then of course you know we are also a commercial company we want to benefit also from the work we are doing the thought leadership we are providing but we believe that comes from a long term strategy not not trying to just basically say hey you can't use our toys because you know uh, it might maximize our return in the short term but it's not going to help us ultimately in the long term and you know our our perspective is very much the customer perspective, right? If I'm a customer who has potentially thousands of suppliers that I'm trying to source digital twins from, how am I going to do that with a single vendor or, or with a closed standard, you know? Absolutely. Now, um, Duality was recently selected as a provider uh, of an advanced environmental simulation technology to help bridge the gap from virtual to real world environments. As part of DARPA, now please, uh, listeners, indulge me. DARPA yeah. is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, yeah. and their Race Sim program. So there's lots of uh, 
uh, to get through there. But um, you know, first of all, congratulations for that. It's such well, a you, such an incredible achievement. Uh, can you tell us about a little bit about that and what that really means in the real world? So it's it's a really interesting story, Francis, in terms of how this program came about. So first of all, DARPA is in fact you know the, the thought leader uh, in terms of uh, research, not just for defense but for social things. Like you know, a lot of people don't realize that they're the, they're the agency that really launched the internet, for example, right? And, and again, also the self-driving car revolution came out of DARPA's sort of challenge and grand challenge in you know 2006 2008 period. Um, which you know my co-founder was involved with. Um, now the interesting thing is that you know the the uh, the the vehicles in the Grand Challenge largely they are autonomous, and most of the cars that drive on our roads you know today you know that that are looking at uh, you know self-driving or piloting self-driving rely heavily on maps to to navigate um, and and you know make sense of what they're going to do. Now, most uh, vehicles, you know, most uh, vehicles, military vehicles don't have a road to drive on often, right? And so what, you know, what DARPA wants to do with the new racer sim challenge is really um, push that part of it forward. You know, how can, so yes, we kind of understand a little bit about how to create autonomy stacks for uh, vehicles that are navigating with maps, but how do you do that when there isn't a road? When you don't know where you can drive or not drive, you have to make those very you know individualist individualist decisions around going left or right or staying straight in real time, right? Um, and, and that's what the racer sim program is is trying to go after. And and very much like the original grand challenge, you know, they're inviting some of the best research teams across the country, universities, private you know private industry, to sort of collaborate and participate in this challenge. Now. The first, you know, the, the grand challenge and the challenge, you know, the original challenge did not have a simulation track in it because at that time, you know, thinking was still like you build the hardware, the hardware is what is important. Um, and then, you know, the software of obviously there's going to be some software to drive the autonomy, but really, you know, building physically building these vehicles is what matters. And I think the industry as a whole, you know, the entire self driving industry has realized that actually some of the biggest differentiation here is in the autonomy software. Right, like what? Once you sense the world around you, whatever in whatever state it is, you know, how does the autonomous brain make sense of that information, mm -hmm. and then how does that actually lead to you know what's called actuation or real decisions around whether you're going to accelerate or steer or brake and so on? How do you figure out what is dangerous within the environment? What do you want to stay away from? When do you need to stop? So. And again, you know, please notice how this is becoming, you know, first it goes from being a physical problem to then becoming a, a, a sort of a machine learning or, or, or an autonomy problem. But eventually it becomes a data problem. You know, almost all of these things at scale turn into data problems, right? How do I learn? Well, I learn by being exposed to as many different conditions as possible. Now you can try to do that in the physical world, but there are inherent limits by physical law on, you know, how much exposure you can give a system, how much it can learn, you know, uh, both in terms of time, in terms of cost, in terms of logistics. You know, you don't want to put people and 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 you know teams within dangerous conditions, for example, right? And this is the benefit of bringing that learning into the enterprise metaverse, right? Once you come into the enterprise metaverse you can you know there's literally an infinite variety of learning environments learning conditions that you can create um and, and so so you know darpa you know being you know they're obviously they're they're some of the sharpest you know people out there and and so they've realized that for racer sim and this off-road vehicle you know autonomy they they've created a simulation track from the very beginning in this challenge and and, and that's you know that's what they've invited us to participate in for us, success will ultimately be if these teams, the other teams, the other racer teams, start adopting simulation as a core methodology, you know, for 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 building these systems. That is ultimately what we are all after. Apuba, we've had some fantastic guests um, on the Metaverse podcast, and and one of the questions I kind of it, it seems quite obvious uh, mm -hmm. to ask everyone is what their vision is. What's your vision is about the metaverse? Where you see this going? Yeah, so it's interesting. The word metaverse, of course, is is rooted in a very dystopian 
vision. And so, uh, you know, and I talk about this with my students at CCA, right? Like, uh, you know, I, I think technology inherently is neither good or bad, in all, you know, in most cases. It's, it's what do we do with it as a society, right? Like Apple famously, I think yesterday has released some kind of a statement saying, you know, oh, we don't believe in, you know, our headset will serve the metaverse. <laughs> and I think that's a very narrow understanding of, you know, what, uh, what the concept is. I think it's very important to uh, let the concept stand on its own, you know, independent of how the phrase was coined or its roots or where it comes from and how other companies might adopt it, right? And that's why, again, we are very careful to say that we are trying to build a metaverse for solving real world problems. For us, the permeability between the physical and the virtual is critical, right? And for us, that is where the value comes from. That's where the value for our customers come from, right? So this is not a metaverse to just immerse yourself in and, and hang out for hours on end, right? It's a very sort of grounded metaverse for getting real work done. And I think that people often forget that, you know, today we do so much of our work online. You know, I mean, if you compare it to what it was pre-COVID and yet we, we have a very narrow set of tools to do that work. So, you know, again, to me, metaverse can be a tool. It can be a technology that we can shape it to uh, help people be more productive, to help this kind of very complex data generation. Now, wh why is this data generation critical? Well, you know, when you look at some of the biggest problems around, you know, let's say climate change or, or even building, let's say near orbit space stations, you know, these are such sort of um, prohibitively complex and expensive problems that we cannot even think about how to approach them today. But of course, collectively as a humanity, we can contribute to solving these problems. But what is the mechanism for that contribution? How do we harvest this kind of human intelligence at scale? Right. Absolutely. You know, so, so this is part of our vision for the enterprise metaverse is that it can be the ultimate place to collaborate and create you know, data that is actually meaningful to our physical world and, and organize that information. You know, one of the one of the most exciting things I think from um, from when I started the podcast Metaverse uh, was the amount of conversations I have uh, with thought leaders and technologists, where it almost always comes back to being creative. It's about creativity and about you know, of co of course we talk about how you know we can better mankind or whatever else, but ultimately it comes back to creativity, and it's really exciting to. Uh, to have those sort of conversations. Now, you of all people uh, probably uh, had the, uh, the fortune, fortune to have on the podcast uh, with your experience at Pixar, uh, with Ratatouille, Shrek, Finding Nemo, Toy Story Three, all these things. Can you can you kind of go back a little bit and describe that story and see and 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 kind of explain a little bit where that background will help us going forward into the future like your personal experience from that creativity standpoint how do you see the metaphors going forward and and you know what part you're going to play in that yeah um now that's that's a that's a really um interesting where you know a personal question that i you know i've thought about quite a bit right and and to me you know part of what was always exciting about working at pixar was you know uh, especially when you know in those days like with things like shrek or ants even before that which was the first film i worked on at, at pdi you know which later became dreamworks uh, you know there's a there's a giant flood at the end of ants right uh, where these ants all get washed out and um at that time we didn't know in computer graphics how to do water how to do you know fluid simulation and uh you know i i partnered with a gentleman called you know nick parker and you know we were able to basically uh like figure that out you know we it, it was more like okay it was not a question of oh uh, we you know we know how to do this great we're just going to do it right it was more like we didn't know how to do it but it was critical to telling the story and so we better figure it out in the next <laughs> you know 17 months and 14 days or whatever it was right uh, and and so i think that challenge of knowing very clearly what you're trying to do because you know you know it's high impact you know it's critical but you don't know how to do it, right? 
And, and so for me, that has always been as a technologist, what has driven me forward. Now, over the years, I've, again, as I realized, you know, that, you know, um, oftentimes we move forward on things like that without taking into consideration the second and third order effects. Now, if you're making a movie, it's not a big deal. You know, you, you solve the problem, you move on. Right. I think that as we approach things like the metaverse, as we look at things that actually have more of a much longer shadow on our physical world, if you will, right? I think it's pretty important to think about where is the compass pointing? Where are you trying to go? So, so from a technologist's perspective, I, I love the challenge of bringing the metaverse to life because we don't know what it is today. And that's okay, but we know that once it exists, it's capable of all kinds of magic, and that's awesome, right? But also thinking about, you know, um, once it is realized, you know, where is it headed? And so I think the, the idea that you put forward around creativity, I think is a really important one because I think you have to think about the human aspect of these technology systems or human technology platforms that we are creating, right? What is, what is the second and third order effects? This is kind of why I teach at CCA and I teach designers because I feel, you know, when you have a table full of, engineers trying to talk about a technology, they all get super excited, right? And then just move forward. And then, you know, you know the business people pile on and, and then, you know, they're like, wait, you know, what's the business side of this? And, and then that's great. The design voices, you know, which often represents the customer are missing in these early conversations. And so that's why I, I believe that for the metaverse, you know, to, to really, again, realize its full potential, you know, beyond interoperability and, and the technology actually taking form, um, the important thing is, is really what is the human angle into this, right? And again, for us, that human angle is in allowing the creation, allowing humans to use their inherent, you know, their, their intrinsic intelligence to help create and train artificial intelligence systems. You know, we talk about how the, you know, AI systems are black boxes. I mean, the way to solve that, I don't think there's a shortcut. I think the way to solve that problem is by having humans be much more involved in the curation of the data, the, you know, the creation of the data sets from which these systems are trained. And if we don't do that, we will just go in circles, right? Now you touched on, you touched on um, the CCA, so the California, California College of Arts, which you, uh, you, you work as a, a adjunct professor. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I would, I would have been, extraordinarily grateful to have you as my professor back at university so, so <laughs> i don't I mean, know if my yeah. students agree <laughs> <laughs> well we can they can they can write in they can send their messages to us. <laughs> That's right. That's um what how do you how do you cover topics like metaverse design when it's such a new area how do yeah. you actually how do you uh how are you able to enunciate this how are you able to get this a, across the line if that makes sense i mean how are you able to add color to something that doesn't really exist at the moment. So, so you know, for the class, and I'm teaching it, you know, with Oren Haskins, who is, who's an art director at Google. So it's a, you know, really great pairing because again, we, we have that left, left brain, right brain, right brain sort of pairing, you know, in terms of, um, uh, you know, for what the students receive, right? Um, but, you know, we are taking, there are three tracks essentially to the class, right? The first is around really giving a strong conceptual foundation. So we actually bothered to have a definition of the metaverse, uh, you know, which, uh, which I'm happy to discuss some, at some point, or, you know, there's some blogs on our site that discuss it as well. But um, so I, I think starting with some, you know, well-grounded concepts, right? Um, the, the second track is really around, and this, I think this is critical. So I think, uh, to have, you know, to understand any sort of complex technology, like you have to have hands-on experience. Now, obviously these are not engineers, these are not technical, uh, you know, minded students necessarily. So we, we try very hard to create uh, a sort of scaffolding so, so that they can learn the Unreal Engine using, you know, some really great tutorials and material that, that Epic provides. In the case of, you know, when I teach, for example, designing for trust, like, we used Google system, you know, auto ML system to actually help them build machine learning models, like bring your data in, think about bias. So one of the things that they do is like, you know, use, use essentially, I, I purposely give them a very biased premise and say, now go build a machine, machine learning model to identify immigrants or something like that, right? Because it, 
it's really funny when you are so focused on solving the problem. I mean, the interesting thing is that those students come back, they build a model and they're very proud of it. And then I suddenly, then it suddenly strikes them like, oh, you know, when you're so focused on solving the problem, you land up doing things that you don't realize. So having that kind of hands-on experience, I think if you're gonna build a metaverse, you have to be able to design a 3D space and understand what it takes to design a 3D space. And then the third track, as you pointed out, this is such a fluid area. It's still very much emerging. And so we invite amazing speakers. You know, we had folks from Roblox and, you know, from, from Epic and, and Google. And, you know, so we have uh, like thought leaders in the space come in and they're so excited to share because, you know, this is an audience that just wants to learn, wants to hear, right? Um, so that's sort of how we approach the class, basically. Amazing. So let's look at the broader scale. What are your sort of predictions for the next 10 years. Oh boy. Because we you know we, we play this, we play this game, you know, we play this game here at Metaverse. Like, come on. So let's come see. on. Cool. And if, cool. you, if you cool. get it, if you get it right, you win a pound or win a, win a dollar. COVID cool. cool. 2027. 20, I don't know. That's, that seems to be the one thing that's a constant at this point, you know. Um, I, I think that we will be grounded. Again, you know, I do think that we will uh, have the virtual and the physical uh, sort of overlapping more and more, you know, whether we like it or not. I think that's a reality of, mm -hmm. so, so what's gonna come in the future? Because I do feel like a lot of people are very um, nervous about that. And, you know, I, I, I think we've talked about digital natives quite a bit, you know, we had generations that, you know, before, you know, that had never used a computer. And then we have the digital natives who were, you know, kind of quite comfortable with computers and mobile phones from the get go. I think we have a generation now, you know, that's spending basically in the US, for example, over 50% of, of uh, kids under 13 are spending some significant amount of time in Roblox, for example, every, every week. I mean, we are getting a generation that is similarly, uh, equally comfortable with having one leg in the virtual and one in the physical. You know, when they think about the relationships, you know, they, they have a permeability between virtual and physical relationships that mm -hmm. honestly, as not being a, let's say metaverse native, we simply cannot have, right? And so I think the future is very much, uh, you know, has the blending of these things. Then, then the question becomes, you know, how do we how do we structure it? How do we put guardrails around it uh, to make sure that we are uh, reaping the benefits of it without necessarily some of the negatives that we see, obviously with isolation and 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 you know with this sort of you know one of the things I worry the most about is sort of the idea of subjective reality, right? So we we see that with you know media bubbles and things like that. But now imagine that in the metaverse, which is much more immersive and much more convincing to your senses. You know, what if I can filter even what you're receiving in real time? You know, if there's somebody in the 3D space that doesn't, you know, saying something you don't like, I could actually filter that and, and change what you're hearing in real time, right? Um, now, if you do that for two people who speak different languages, that is awesome. If you do that to prevent an exchange of ideas and concepts, uh, and sort of to, you know, you short circuit that process, that's not so great. Um, and here the question is also, who is the I? Who, who, is, who is modulating this, this universe, right? And, and uh, what gives them the authority to do that? So these are some of the more thornier questions that I think um, need to get addressed. Now the corner of the metaverse that we sit in, you know, which is more on the enterprise side, of course, we we are more focused on that permeability between the physical and and the and the virtual, and so we we have a you know our compass is pointing very firmly in in sort of what we know is going to add value. Um, but I think if I were building a social metaverse, for example, uh, right now, I. I think you know you need to be thinking really, really deeply about these things, and not just in terms of the technology, but in terms of the second and third order effects. You know. Okay, my my last question: What does twenty twenty two hold for you, Apuva? And uh, and uh, of course, duality robotics. Where are you going to go? What's going to happen? How are you going to win this? <laughs> um, 
uh, responsibly. Number one, we're going to win it. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I think what we are very excited about, you know, we've had some amazing anchor customers that, you know, we've, we've started a journey with and they validate sort of what we've built with Falcon. For us, you know, coming, you know, to 2022, we really, again, believe that we are, we are sort of looking outwards more this year where we are saying, hey, let's find a partner ecosystem. Uh, let's look at some of these digital twin and, and enterprise metaverse problems for customers more from an end-to-end -end perspective. You know, whether whether they are product twins or environment twins or you know, uh, you know, more complicated robotics twins. What what does a customer want end-to-end? -end? And and again, you know, a lot of our early work has been around designing systems and validating you know software stacks. We believe that you know the the digital twins and enterprise metaverse have uh, equal value for you know for training, for marketing, for you know the entire product lifecycle. And so, looking at those end-to-end -end value propositions, uh, you know, for for our customers is really where we are focused on for this year. Listen, you've been listening to Metaverse with me, Francis Hellier. Thank you to my guest Apoorva Shah for what was a fantastic conversation. I'm so grateful for your time. Um, tweet us at Metaverse Pod for any suggestions or feedback. And if you enjoyed the podcast, please do share a link on social media. You can sign up to receive an email when a new episode drops at our website, metaverse.fm. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. <laughs>